When I first heard about the Alabama ruling, I realized that I wanted to do a video on it to engage the biblical texts the writers of it were drawing from. What I did not realize was how far back their ruling would be reaching, which theologians of the church they would draw upon, and how simplistic their engagement with the biblical texts throughout would be. What I'm trying to say is that the ruling turned out to be more disturbing than I initially expected. In the meantime, I was also invited to collaborate on a position paper presenting the scientific and religious issues with the ruling, urging Congress to pass a federal protection of IVF, an invitation I accepted. Uh, we have hashed out a near completed draft and are in the process of getting a handful of Nobel laureates in the sciences, colleagues of the two scientists I work with, to sign on to it. And then we'll be trying to get it published, something like hopefully the New York Times or Washington Post, we'll see. Somewhere members of Congress can see it, as well as other members of the general public. What I was reminded of in terms of the science of human reproduction and a few key statistics related to human embryos that I learned in the process of working on that paper need to be more widely talked about, it seems to me. Thus, here's what I'd like to do in this video. <clears throat> First, I would like to share the scientific data that it is helpful to know for this conversation. Then I will give as brief of an overview as I can of the main theological or biblical claims that the ruling is using so that you can have the gist of what's going on. And then I'll offer additional food for thought on what the ruling is leaving out or overlooking. I'm also gonna record a separate video where I'll work through the actual language of the ruling so that you can see it for yourself. I'll put it on the screen and offer my own uh, responses to it as we go. There are several links in the description to this video that uh, take you to articles related to this, these topics, the Alabama ruling, et cetera, okay? So the scientific data, the most rel relevant scientific data um, in this conversation. <clears throat> IVF was introduced in the United States in 1978 and an estimated 12 million people have been born using this technology. Let's just sit on that for a second. <laughs> the reasons for seeking IVF go beyond general infertility reasons, but also include situations where one member of the couple has cancer or any of the nearly 400 rare genetic diseases, such as Tay-Sachs, hemophilia A and B, macular dystrophy, cardiofacio-cutaneous syndrome, which was brought to my attention by a friend from high school. Perhaps of interest is that former President Mike Pence and his wife Karen did use IVF. And Mike Pence went on record in 2022 after Roe v. Wade was overturned, stating that he thinks there should be legal protections for, for, for fertility treatments. One news article attesting to this is in the description of this video. To keep things real, the Pence has likely destroyed unused embryos. Should they be charged with murdering embryos as children? No, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But that's what this ruling would suggest, isn't it? Okay, now, the ruling in Alabama is akin to other initiatives around the country in that one of the ideas it relies upon is that, quote, human life begins at conception, end quote which is to say at the time of the union of the sperm and egg cell. This is not scientifically true, however, okay? So while a fertilized egg will begin its aliveness thing, it will start to divide, right, multiply, um, and become a mor morula, it's hard to say, a morula, which is a cluster of cells that look like a berry, maybe of the black or raspberry formation. And that will keep developing and then will keep dividing and that is what becomes a blastocyst right which is looks more like a cluster of grapes um, and that has a sac formed around them here's where the science is incredibly important no human individual can be biologically determined until at least 14 days after egg cell fertilization the point at which a body begins to form I realize this has issues related to abortion, but I'm just not going to get into that right now. Okay, and here I'm quoting from our position paper. Quote, this is easily seen in the appearance of identical twins. We're One pre-implantation embryo splits to make two as late as 14 days. 
also worth noting. Two, pre-implantation embryos can also fuse in nature, resulting in one viable person comprised of organs from two separate fertilized egg cells. So the point here is that while behaving like a living thing at fertilization, an embryo is not yet a child, okay? Next up in scientific data is the fact that up to two thirds of all naturally fertilized egg cells, think about that for a moment, never attach to the uterus and therefore never become a pregnancy, okay? The language of life at conception ignores this fact about human reproduction. To put it differently, if early embryos are in fact children, as the Alabama court insists, then people all around the world face an unseen massive health crisis with millions of so-called babies dying annually in the first days of life. So this theological claim is not sustainable when you look at the science. Or we could take the playful observation of a friend of mine just this morning. What's to stop a person from procuring a half dozen embryos in order to claim six dependents on their tax returns? Please do consider, additionally, that we can freeze an embryo for years, warm it, and it will continue development into a blastocyst, into a fetus, and then into a child. We cannot freeze a child and then reheat it and expect it to survive. Equating an embryo with a child is not just disingenuous, it is not accurate. The science here needs to be taken quite seriously. With all of these points noted, I want to make sure you are aware of HR 1011, the Life at Conception Act, which has 120 Republicans having signed on to it. It is scientifically inaccurate and not even biblically sound. In the description of this video, I have the links to an article discussing the bill and to the list of names of the Congress people who have signed on to support the bill. That's the basic scientific data that I think is most important for now for understanding why this ruling is misguided. So now let me simply offer the highlights theologically, biblically speaking. Judge Parker's comments are based upon these four premises. One, humans are created in God's image. Two, injuring a human is an injury to God. Three, man's purpose is to know and love God. And I'm not gonna comment on the use of man here. And four, a reference to the sixth commandment. So let me just point out very quickly now, the Sixth Commandment does say, thou shalt not murder. But that is a verb implying, thou shalt not plot to kill your neighbor. It's not simply about not taking a life. Lots of, consider, if you will, the parallel to any other language where we have to establish the terms for a range of the reasons for someone's death, if you will. <clears throat> so quoting from Judge Parker, Quote, humans, human life cannot be wrongfully destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy God, end quote. And, quote, even before birth, he added, all human beings have the image of God and their lives cannot be destroyed without effacing his glory, end quote. These two comments do sum things up fairly well from the rest of what I've seen. So again, to cut to the chase, what all of this is overlooking is the first part of the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There are other religious interpretations of these same scriptures that he turns to, and some beyond those, that see the starting point for human life as much later than simply when the egg and sperm meet. You can find deliberations in Jewish texts that will put the sanctity of the life of the pregnant woman ahead of the gestating fetus, even quite late in a pregnancy. There are some Christians who claim it is at the point of quickening. There are some people who will turn to Genesis 2-7 and say it's when a person takes their own first breath. 
<laughs> this letter may sound a little bit outlandish, but it is a claim pointing to a biblical text, right? And that's the other main point I would like to make. I respect people's right to interpret their scriptures however they wish. I might want them to be a bit better informed on all of the things related to those texts that are so sacred to them, but that is neither here nor there for this conversation. What is important here is that there is more than one way to engage and apply the meanings found in scriptures. While Judge Parker's claims may be those of others in the state of Alabama or even across our country, they do not reflect the beliefs of every citizen of Alabama, Christian or otherwise. So he is abusing his position of power to affect legislation that disregards the First Amendment of our United States Constitution and is overruling other religiously held beliefs about these matters in doing so. Okay, so here's kind of the my thoughts in response to the content in the ruling, which I'll look at in a separate video, and the general language of what we find in the ruling, okay? Religious language does not belong in legal conversation that is trying to honor biology, anatomy, the functions of a potentially pregnant person's body, the natural processes of human creation, procreation. Religious language does not belong in that conversation. The overreach that sanctity of life justifies comes from not seeing the full picture very accurately, it seems to me. It's being applied solely at the pre-viable and end-of-life settings, euthanasia, without keeping the decades in between in view as well. Any decisions made will be short-sighted and disrespectful to the vi fully viable, already living humans who are or will be impacted by the decisions. Judge Parker's interpretation of humans being made in the image of God, his interpretation of that ignores the centuries of debate over the issue. The most popular claims by men <laughs> have been our bodily form is what it means that we're made in, if humans are made in God's image, our, our reason or our moral judgment. Some women have suggested it is the ability to create other humans and others in general have said it's the ability to create in general because that's what God does there in that first creation story is create everything. All of these have been proposed, yet none of these are possessed by an embryo. People will also turn to Jeremiah 1.5 and Psalm 139.13. And that passage from Jeremiah says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. And I ordained you to a prophet, excuse me, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. This is being quoted very much out of context. Like the very similar Psalm 139.13, this text poetically celebrates God's omniscience and providence, even extending these powers to before conception. But none of the texts mentioned, nor any other in the Bible, equate the early embryo with a born child. They couldn't have, right? Taking the totality of biblical content on how God is depicted interacting with the humans he created, however, will leave you with a dramatically different image of the situation. God outright orders Joshua to lead the people into Canaan, to co conquer, slaughter, and destroy the men, women, children, and often the livestock already living in that area. God is depicted speaking through the prophets in threatening and debasing ways. God is depicted threatening to rape, kill, harm, isolate, and punish in all kinds of ways any person or group of people who are not worshiping him solely and correctly. When people use biblical ideas uncritically, as most of the theological claims quoted in the ruling do, they will be led to think of women's roles on this planet, first and foremost, as that of bringing children into the world. 
This means that conversations about pregnancies within this worldview will not consider the pregnant person to even be relevant to that conversation. When it comes to the concept of sanctity of life, I would bring in the larger picture of how we define life at all and suggest that it not happen in a vacuum where only the embryo or fetus is in view, but also the life and body of the person that might carry that embryo or fetus to term. Sanctity of life then should extend as vigorously to the children already viable and living their lives as these people are trying to get us to protect these so-called extra uterine children. I'm talking about caring for the children trying to thrive within a society Lady. upon racist and sexist systemic exploitation of people's labor and that keeps poor neighborhoods full of poor people without access to meaningful resources for a healthy and vibrant life. If this was all actually about sanctity of life, people would be lining up to learn how to dismantle the elements of our structures and institutions that end up oppressing people instead of helping them. So this really is not about sanctity of life. This is about controlling the bodies that can produce life. Those are my thoughts on this rather important ruling in the state of Alabama. Those are my thoughts in general, trying to keep them as short and sweet as possible. Thanks for watching. I hope you will also take a look at this, the second video where I walk through the language found in the ruling, just so you're familiar with it. Take care.